I'm hit the record button and I'm going to share my screen. All right, so this is the little PowerPoint that I've modified from my lecture PowerPoint so we can cover some, a little bit of the, the, the structural anatomy of the of muscle, really skeletal muscle tissue. And then um, we have to look at some of the organelles that are inside of muscle cells. We got to see what types of proteins are in the muscle cell. What are the names of those proteins? What do the proteins do? Um, and how the nervous system communicates to our skeletal muscles in order to cause our muscles to contract, all right? And we're gonna cover a couple other things in here, but let's go ahead and get started with this. So this first slide that I have here is just a basic outline of the three different types of muscle tissue that are in the body. We're gonna concentrate our efforts on the physiology of skeletal muscle, but I'll, I'll mention cardiac and smooth muscle as well. Um, but skeletal muscles, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, skeletal muscle tissue is found in the skeletal muscles that you are learning how to identify right now. Like all those muscles in the forearm and the thigh and the lower leg, all those muscles you're learning, those muscles are made up of the skeletal muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle tissue is only found in your heart. And then smooth muscle is actually found in several different places of the body. Um, it, there's numerous locations for it. Uh, smooth muscle uh, is found around many of the blood vessels in our body. And the that smooth muscle can contract and relax. All muscle tissue does two things, contracts and relaxes, and that's it. So the smooth muscle around the blood vessels in the body can control the diameter of the blood vessel. So if the smooth muscle relaxes, the diameter gets bigger. If the smooth muscle contracts, the diameter gets smaller. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I'm I'm dealing with allergies today pretty badly. Um, so smooth muscle is also found lining around your gastrointestinal tract. That's a smooth muscle around your stomach. Like when your stomach growls, that's smooth muscle contracting. So that smooth muscle contracts in the stomach so your stomach can churn up your food. Contraction through your intestine moves your food through the intestine, so forth and so on. So <clears throat> smooth muscle is found in many places. Um, so just know, you know, their location, some basic functions right here, although this for smooth muscle, uh, you know, we're not learning all of the functions. It, it, that's why I put various functions here. And I put example peristalsis. Peristalsis is a type of contraction through the gastrointestinal tract, your stomach and your intestines that move, even in your esophagus, that moves food through your digestive system. That's what peristalsis is, all right? Now, as far as the appearance of the tissue itself, if we were to look at it under a microscope, and you'll, you'll be seeing some of that histology, I'm sure, in some of those assignments, you would notice skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle are both striated. They have these little lines that run through the muscle tissue. So when these little lines are observable in the muscle tissue, we say that the muscle tissue is striated, right? So both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle striated, but smooth muscle is not. <clears throat> smooth muscle does not contain those striations. So we have to learn today what makes up these striations, all right? And I'm going to show you what makes these lines up in a minute once we get to what sarcomeres are, but just for quick reference now, the, the arrangements of the proteins on the inside of the muscle cells, either skeletal muscle cell or cardiac muscle cell, those proteins are arranged in regular repeating patterns that form these striations, all right? <clears throat> now, skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated. It's only one of two cells in our body that have more than one nucleus. All the other cells in your body have one nucleus, like all epithelial cells that we learned about in chap uh, the histology chapter, 
any cell you can think of um, has one nucleus. So when it has one nucleus, we typically call that uninucleated, uninucleated. So cardiac muscle and, and smooth muscle is uninucleated. Now, skeletal muscle is voluntarily regulated. That means you can contract it or relax your muscles when you want to <clears throat> under conscious control. Now, the respiratory muscles, like your diaphragm, is skeletal muscle. However, when we go to sleep or we become unconscious, there's a part of the nervous system that automatically regulates our respiratory muscles for us in an unconscious manner and so that we still breathe when we're sleeping. However, when you're awake, you can have control over those respiratory muscles. Like you can hold your breath or you can hyperventilate if you want to breathe faster than normal. You have conscious control over that. However, you don't go through the whole day going, I need to breathe, contract the diaphragm. I need to breathe, contract the diaphragm. So it, it still happens automatically. All right. <clears throat> so that, that skeletal muscle is a little bit different because obviously we have to breathe when we're sleeping. Now, both cardiac and smooth muscle are under involuntary regulation. They're controlled automatically from the unconscious parts of our nervous system, the unconscious parts of our brain that we're going to be learning about in a couple of weeks when we do the brain chapter. <clears throat> so we say they are involuntary. For instance, you can't tell your heart consciously to speed up or slow down. It does so, but under unconscious control. Does that make sense? So voluntary or involuntary. So just learn a little bit that I have in this table. Now, as far as the connective tissue components and the arrangements of muscle cells in the muscle organ, I'm going to use this picture for you to be able to learn where these structures are located. So if you notice here, they show the arm. They show a large muscle right here. In fact, that one looks like, although it's a graphic, would be the brachioradialis that you guys are learning. That's the left arm. Um, and so that's where the brachioradialis would be. I can't really tell since it's just a simple diagram, but that's a big one in our forearm. And now they enlarge it so we can see what the muscle, how, how the muscle tissue is organized, how the muscle organ is organized. So notice I say muscle organ. When I say muscle organ, I mean the whole muscle this whole muscle, because <clears throat> ultimately we're going to learn about what a muscle cell is. A muscle cell is also called a muscle fiber. So you see right here, muscle fiber, and they have cell in parentheses. So this little tubular structure that the artist drew in and pulled out of this larger cir circular structure, that's the muscle cell. It's called a muscle fiber or a myofiber. So I need you guys to try and keep these, these terms straight because there's a lot of myo this and myofiber, myofibril. And so I need to teach you what all those terms are. So let's look at the connective tissue components. Everybody knows probably at this point that the muscle organ and skeletal muscles in this case are attached to a bone with a tendon. We know that tendons attach muscle to bone, right? That tendon is actually made up of all of those collagen fibers of other connective tissue sheets as well that converge and combine together at the ends of the muscle. So there is a connective tissue wrapping that surrounds the entire muscle organ on the outside of it. That connective tissue wrapping is called the epimysium. Similar to epidermis, right? With the skin, the epidermis was above the dermis. The epimysium is the uppermost connective tissue membrane around the muscle organ. Now, if we cut the muscle open and look in it, we would be able to observe an arrangement and organization of a whole bunch of muscle cells 
into little circular tubular shaped sections. So each one of these little circular sections that are outlined right here, though that big circular thing is not a muscle cell. It's actually a bundle of many muscle cells organized together in that bundle. So the connective tissue on the inside of the muscle organ arranges all of the muscle cells into these circular structures right here. So the artist pulls one of them out so we can see it kind of in 3D looking, although it's a 2D picture. That's called a fossicle. So all of the muscle cells or muscle fibers inside of the skeletal muscle is arranged in tubular shaped structures called fossicles. Now, what separates one fossicle from its neighboring fossicle, from its neighbor, from its neighbor? Well, connective tissue. So the connective tissue that bundles all the cells into these fossicles and thus separates them from the other fossicles is called the perimyceum. <clears throat> now, the prefix peri means around. So you can remember that term by saying, okay, the perimyceum is the connective tissue membrane around a fossicle. Now, so we have the epimyceum on the top. We have the perimyceum around the fossicle. On the inside of the fossicle are where many, many muscle cells are located. So the artist pulls this one out. So that, mu that muscle fiber, myofiber, or muscle cell, all three of those names mean the same thing. Each one of the muscle cells that are inside of the fossicle are separated from each other by a connective tissue membrane. So the connective tissue that separates each muscle fiber from every other muscle fiber within a fossicle is called the endomyceum. So the endomyceum is a connective tissue that wraps around each muscle fiber. It's called the endomyceum because it's the innermost connective tissue wrapping. So you have the epimyceum on the top, you have the perimyceum around the fossicle, and you have the endomyceum around each one of the muscle cells. Now, this is where students typically get confused because if you look at this picture, we have this tubular structure and it got a little tube coming out of it. But then we have this tubular structure and we have a little tube coming out of it. These are not the same two pictures. So what the artist did is they took this fossicle and enlarged it. So this whole thing right here is this fossicle enlarged. So surrounding this fossicle is the perimyceum. On the inside of the fossicle are each of the muscle cells. So this would be a myofiber. This would be a muscle fiber. That one would be each one of these circles. And this circle is now an individual muscle cell. But if you notice, on the inside of each one of these are these little bitty circles, which is this little tube thing looking, this tubular looking thing right here. So this whole thing right here is a single skeletal muscle cell and all of the protein on the inside of that skeletal muscle fiber, muscle cell is arranged into these little tubular structures. So notice the inside of our muscle cell is loaded down with a whole bunch of little tubes. Each one of these little tubes is called a myofibril. The myofibrils contain little protein filaments that run the length through this tube. 
So those look like little tubes in this tube, which are called the myofilaments. Even though they didn't put myo right here, you probably will read that term. The myofilaments or just filament are the protein filaments inside of the myofibril. So you see how it, can, it might get a little confusing if you don't try to keep it straight because skeletal muscle really is a large tube with tubes on the inside of it. And that tube is composed of tubes on the inside of it. And that tube is composed of tubes on the inside of it. So we have tubes in a tube, tubes in a tube, and tubes in a, the tube. It's weird. We have all these tubular looking arrangements for our skeletal muscle tissue. <clears throat> so again, this whole thing is the muscle organ attached to the bone, surrounded by the epimyceum. Inside there, the perimyceum arranges all of the muscle fibers into little circular structures called fossicles. On the inside of the fossicle are the muscle fibers or muscle cells. So we look at the fossicle enlarged. Now, each one of these circular structures is a muscle cell. So this is microscopic. So that muscle cell is called a myofiber, muscle fiber, or muscle cell. Those three names identify this cell. On the inside of the myofiber is or are many myofibrils. The fibrils, the myofibrils are composed of the muscle proteins arranged in these circular structures, the myofibrils. And those muscle proteins are the myofilaments. And here they just identify it as filament. So you have myofilaments make up the myofibril. The myofibrils make up the myofiber or muscle fiber or muscle cell. The muscle cells are all arranged in a fossicle. And the fossicles are confined inside of the whole muscle organ surrounded by the epimyceum. So we have the epimyceum the perimyceum that's around the fossicle, and you have an endomyceum that surrounds each muscle cell, which separates it from all of the other muscle cells. So before we move forward, does anybody have any questions with that? Kind of strange, right? Oh, this is also a scanning electron micrograph of a real uh, muscle cell right here that's kind of, you know, been teased open. And all of these little tubes in here are the myofibrils. Like this whole thing right here is a single skeletal muscle cell, all right? And those little tubes inside of it are the myofibrils, which are made up of a whole bunch of muscle proteins in, that are arranged in these little tubes. So those muscle proteins are called myofilaments. All right. Now, <clears throat> what you're looking at here is a different view and an enlarged view of a fossicle. Around the fossicle on the outside, which holds and arranges the cells on the inside of the fossicle, is the perimyceum. That's that connective tissue membrane right there, the perimyceum. On the inside, each muscle fiber is separated from every other muscle fiber inside of the fossicle by a connective tissue membrane. That connective tissue membrane is called the endomyceum. On the outside of there, we have the stem cells, which are called satellite cells on the inside of the fossicle and around the outside of the endomyceum. You're gonna see this. I don't know if I identified it on the, mu on the muscle cell model or not, but 
after I'm done with the packet, I'm going to pull that muscle cell model up so we can identify some of this stuff on a real model. So now what they did is they took, the artist did, they took one of these muscle cells or muscle fiber and enlarged it over here. So now what you're looking at on this picture is not a fossicle. It's an individual muscle fiber, muscle cell. Now the endomycium has been removed. So the connective tissue wrapping around it is not on this picture, but rather what you're looking at with this little blue structure is the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. And the plasma membrane of a muscle cell is called the sarcolemma. Now, <clears throat> back in general biology, some of, for some of y'all that might've been last semester, others, it might've been a long time ago, who knows? But in general biology, I'm sure you remember learning about some of the organelles and the structure of a cell in general. Like everybody knows the word plasma membrane, I'm sure, right? Um, if you remember the endoplasmic reticulum, you had the rough, you had the smooth ER, some of those names probably sound familiar. Well, in skeletal muscle cells or muscle cells in general, muscle physiology, some of these organelles, we change their name. So again, for instance, the plasma membrane is called the sarcolemma. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum that you learned about a long time ago is not called the smooth ER anymore. In skeletal muscle tissue, it's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is just nothing more than smooth ER. All of this, this organelle right here that surrounds each of these myofibrils, that is smooth ER, but it's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, all right? So some of the organelles are going to change their names. Some of them won't. Like for instance, everybody remembers mitochondria. A mitochondria is a mitochondria. So we don't change that name. Really the two things that were, were really three things we're changing the name of. We're changing the name of plasma membrane to sarcolemma. We're changing the smooth endoplasmic reticulum name to sarcoplasmic reticulum. And if you remember on the inside of all cells in the body, what, what do we call that, that fluid and all the organelles on the inside of a cell? Who remembers that? Cytoplasm. Cytoplasm, very good. In muscle tissue physiology, we're gonna change the name cytoplasm to sarcoplasm. So we really changed three names. We have the sarcoplasmic reticulum instead of smooth ER, sarcolemma instead of plasma membrane, and now the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle cell is going to be called the sarcoplasm. Now, I will say this. The sarcoplasm of muscle tissue, it does have some, some fluid in there. The fluid, the fluid portion of cytoplasm is called cytosol. But the fluid portion in muscle tissue is limited. There is, there is water in here. I'm not saying they're not. But... The whole inside of a, of a skeletal muscle cell is loaded down with protein. In fact, muscle tissue has the densest concentration of protein out of all cells in the body. That's where the majority of your protein is in muscle tissue. You guys probably know that already. So since there's so much protein, it pretty much fills the entire space of the sarcoplasm. So notice all the myofibrils, these little tubes, which have the proteins in them. Remember the tubular structures on the inside of a muscle cell is called the myofibril. So this whole thing is a myofibril, right? So here they show it right here. This tube is a myofibril. This one is a myofibril, so forth and so on. Each one of these tubes is called a myofibril. So... <clears throat> Um, each one of the myofibrils is composed of all the proteins we're about to learn. After I finish going over the structural uh, arrangements of everything, we're going to learn the thick and thin filaments. Uh, we're going to learn the other proteins as well. All right. Before I do that, though, before we move forward, 
The other thing that I have to show you, which is very important for the physiology of muscle regulate muscle contraction regulation, is this. The sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane, surrounds the outside of the cell. And that's true. Surrounds the outside of the cell. However, unlike other plasma membranes of other cells, this plasma membrane called the sarcolemma has invaginations of the membrane that dive deep into the cell. That's what these little tubes are. These little blue tubes that the artist drew in. Notice they go around each of the myofibrils at various junction points. So the actual phospholipid bilayer that makes up this membrane dives into the sarcoplasm as a tube. Now this tube has a name and is very important. It's called a transverse tubule. You'll also see the name just T tubule. It's shortened just saying T tubule. Oh, here's the T tubule right here. Now it's called transverse because that tube goes from the top of the cell and it traverses deep into the cell. So notice the tube is open on the outside. Who remembers what the name of the fluid is that bathes the outside of all the cells in the body? What's the name of that fluid? Anybody? What's the name of the fluid that's on the outside of the cell? What's the name of the fluid on the inside of the cell? All right, I guess y'all didn't uh, cover that yet. I don't know. I, I thought you did. Um, the fluid on the outside of all cells is called just generically extracellular fluid. Extra means outside of. It's also called interstitial fluid. So that fluid out here has several names. The extracellular fluid that's in, that's on the outside of your blood cells, inside of your blood vessels is called what? What's the fluid portion of blood called? Plasma. So plasma is an extracellular fluid. Now I'm telling you this for a reason. I know I'm probably boring you right now, but we're leading up to it our physiology. The extracellular fluid on the outside of the cell actually can, it flows in this tube. Now, as it flows into the tube, it, it basically, it fills up all this tube, the, the T-tubule system. However, the extracellular fluid cannot get to the inside of the cell because it's confined within this tube. Now, the reason why that's important is because of, of electrical potentials that we're about to talk about. Electrical potentials will go down the lengths of these T-tubules and generate some physiological steps that are gonna be important to get the muscle to contract. So we have these arrangements of, of structures that are important. The sarcolemma is gonna be important because that's where it's gonna communicate with the nervous system, some receptors on there. The T-tubules are gonna be important. Diving inward from the sarcolemma deep in the cell actually goes around the, uh, around the myofibrils, but makes contact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this sarcoplasmic reticulum, I forgot to tell you, we can also call that SR, just to shorten it up. It's called the SR. So the T-tubules make contact with the SR. That means the SR is going to be important. And the SR is going to be important because it is going to store some ions for us, in particular calcium ions. It's a whole bunch of calcium ions in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that we need to come out. So we have to have a way of signaling in order for the SR to release calcium. <laughs> That's part of the physiology talk we're about to do. Now, structurally, what is important is the arrangements of the proteins in a myofibril. So we have regular repeating units of arranged protein filaments. 
called a sarcomere. So earlier I said skeletal muscle tissue is striated. And I said cardiac muscle tissue is striated. Now what makes those striations up? Well, the arrangement of the muscle, the myofilaments, the filament proteins on the inside of the cell are arranged in regular repeating units called a sarcomere. So you would have one sarcomeric unit here. You would have an identical one next to it over here, another one over here, all the way down the length of all of the myofibrils are sarcomeres like that, <laughs> right? So now this is a very generalized picture showing the arrangements of some, the myofibril, obviously on the inside of the muscle fiber. It shows a sarcolemma still this little line outlined in blue. It shows a very uh, simplistic diagram of a T tubule. However, T tubules are interconnected throughout the entire cell all to the other side as well. So we have the, the sarcolemma, the T tubule. We also have the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So obviously these three names are going to be important with our physiology talk. We also have the myofibrils that run the length, these tubular structures with our muscle proteins in there arranged in regular repeating units called a sarcomere, right? Run, those myofibrils run the length of the, my, of the muscle cell, the myofiber. Now, there are special proteins that help anchor the myofibrils to the sarcolemma, specifically to transmembrane proteins that are in the sarcolemma. So these myofibrils are anchored to the ends of the cell by a protein called dystrophin. So everybody see this name, dystrophin? This is a pretty important protein. It doesn't bring about contraction. All of the contractile filaments are in the myofibril. So just to, to get a little ahead of the story, when the muscle contracts, it contracts because the, the contractile proteins in each myofibril is shortening each sarcomeric unit, which shortens the myofibril towards the middle. Now, if this myofibril was not anchored to the sarcolemma. This whole tube could shorten on the inside of the cell, but it would not cause the edges of the cell to move at all. So if it's not connected to the edges of the cell, the myofibrils are trying to contract, but the cell is not going to contract, which means the skeletal muscle as a whole is not going to contract. So I'm sure everybody knows a disorder called muscular dystrophy. Y'all heard of that before, right? There's actually different forms of it. But one form of it is where individuals don't make dystrophin appropriately. And it, get, it makes them have weak muscle contractions or paralysis. Right. So this dystrophin protein is thought to disseminate the force generated from a contracting myofibril to the sarcolemma, because if this myofibril shortens towards the middle, um, if this myofibril shortens towards the middle of the cell in this direction and it's it's pulling on the dystrophin protein, which is pulling on the sarcolemma the sarcolemma would also be pulled this way. Does that make sense? I'm assuming you guys can still hear me, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Yes, good. yes. All right, perfect, thank you. Sometimes my mic goes out, that's why I wanna ask. All right, so that's what I'm trying to get across to you is if this structure, which is responsible for contraction, and that's what we're about to learn. The, all the proteins for contracting a muscle cell and thus the muscle organ is housed in this little tube. So these little tubes have to shorten. 
That's what contraction is. If this tube is not anchored to the membrane, the tube can shorten in the middle, but the membrane would never move ever, which means the muscle cell would not shorten, which is contraction. So the muscle cell wouldn't contract. So that's why we need that dystrophin. All right. Now, what we're about to learn are how are all of the muscle proteins arranged to form this structure called a sarcomere. So from one little bitty line right here to the next one is one sarcomeric unit, one. But they run in tandem, like this would be one here in the myofibril. Then you would go from this Z disc, it's called a Z disc, to the next one. This would be another sarcomeric unit. Then that would be another one. That would be another one all the way until you get to the very end of the myofibril, which runs the entire length of the muscle cell. This is exactly what gives skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle its striation. So let's take a look at it real quick. You're gonna be expected to identify the parts of a sarcomere, by the way. And it's not too terribly difficult. However, what makes it kind of, you know, troublesome for some students is not that it's hard is that we're learning so many names at one time so this is why i said a, really over a week ago time management is your best friend when you're learning how to do muscle and skeletal identification and muscle physiology because there's a ton of names right so it's not that it's hard your brain has to have time to remember all of these names. So let's look at, first of all, the, the gen generic structure of a sarcomere. A sarcomere is defined as an individual contractile element. A contractile element inside of a myofibril. So the, the definitive lines of one sarcomere Delineating it from another sarcomere are these little wavy lines that you see here. This wavy line is called a Z disc. So from one Z disc all the way to another Z disc is an individual sarcomeric unit, which is the individual contractile element of a myofibril. Now, what gives the muscle tissue its striation is the arrangement of what we call thick and thin myofilaments in the myofibril. The thick and thin myofilaments here, just called thin filament and thick filament, is actin and myosin. Actin and myosin filaments, the thick, the thin filament and the thick filament, respectively, actin and myosin are referred to as the contractile proteins in muscle tissue. All three muscle tissue types have exactly the same contractile proteins. Now, their regulation is fundamentally different in smooth muscle, but I'm going to deal with that later. But we still have a thin filament called actin and a thick filament called myosin in all three muscle tissue types. Now, the arrangement of the thick and thin filaments, the arrangement in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle is the same. That is to say, the thick and thin filaments are arranged in sarcomeric units in myofibrils in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. However, smooth muscle does not have regular repeating sarcomeric units. Hold on one second. 
Sorry, I had to let my dog out. All right, so cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle have their thick and thin filaments arranged just like this picture that you're looking at. The thin filament in this picture are these little, kind of look like they're twisted up little yellow lines here, right? That's the thin filament. All of the thin filaments are directly anchored to the Z-disc. Notice the, that little yellow filament is called the thin filament or actin filament is anchored directly to the Z-disc on either side. The thick filament, the myosin filament, is not directly anchored to the Z-disc at all but rather it is structurally supported and suspended in the middle of the entire sarcomeric unit. And the protein that anchors, I don't wanna say anchor, the protein that arranges and organizes the thick myosin filament in the middle of a sarcomeric unit is this spring looking protein. Notice how it looks like a little spring. That's called Titan. So Titan is a protein that organizes and stabilizes the thick filament. So the thick filament is suspended in the middle. The thin filaments are anchored to the Z disc. The thick filament, the myosin filament, is actually made up of individual myosin molecules that have these little bitty circular head groups on them. Do you guys see these little bitty head groups right here? So you see the filament, the base of the filament in the middle, but then you see these little bitty circular structures that pop up off the top of it at either end of the filament. Those little circular structures are the molecular motor that drives contraction. So the two contractile filaments in all three muscle types are called actin and myosin. But we have to have a motor that physically drives contraction. Just like the motor in your car drives your car. So we call the molecular the, we call myosin the molecular motor because it's a molecule that can move something just like your motor moves your car so the myosin molecule is considered to be the molecular motor my goal today is to teach you how we get this myofibril to shorten so i'm going to teach you a little bit from here and then we'll continue with it as well and i can always come back to this picture but here's how contraction basically is going to work without getting into the fine details of the physiology yet. In order for this entire myofibril to shorten, which is contraction, each sarcomeric unit has to shorten. So what shortens the sarcomeric unit? But rather, these little myosin head groups. Notice the artist shows a couple of them touching the thin filament. So all of the myosin head groups on this side of what we call the M line. The M line is the very middle of the myosin filament. I'm going to tell you what this protein is in a second. So on either end, away from the midline or M line of the myosin filament, these little myosin head groups reach up, bind to the thin filament. And all of the head groups on the left over here pull on the thin filament towards the M line in this direction. All of the head groups to the right reach up and bind to the thin filament and they pull the thin filament towards the M line in this direction. Now, since the thin filaments are anchored to the Z disc. When the thin filament is being pulled on, 
by the myosin head group, the Z disc is being pulled as well to the middle, which would shorten the entire sarcomeric unit. So that's why the thick and the thin filament are referred to as contractile proteins, because these are the two proteins that are directly involved in bringing about contraction. Now we, we have two other groups of proteins. We have regulatory proteins. We're gonna learn the two names of those. And we have a few of the structural proteins we have to learn, like I already told you, Titan. Myomycin is this one. So I'm gonna tell you a couple of them in a second. So before I move forward, is everybody kind of understanding how contraction is going to occur with these two filaments? Does anybody have any questions about what I, what I mean to say when I say the myosin head group is pulling on the thin filament? Yep. All right, very good. Now, the last thing that we really have to cover on this picture of a sarcomere is we have to identify the parts of it. So what do I mean by parts? Well, we can identify different places within a sarcomere based on which proteins are found within the sarcomere at that area. So it's a little bit easier to see it at the top. So earlier I said that the arrangement of the myofilaments in sarcomeric structures in the myofibril is what gives skeletal and cardiac muscle its striated appearance. So here's why. Look at the area that's just around a Z disc. The area just around a Z disc in a relaxed muscle, that's a muscle that's not contracting. In a relaxed muscle, the, the protein just around the Z disc is really only thin filament. Notice we have this area right here with thin filament. The thick filament's over here. So the area just around the Z disc always looks lighter under the microscope than the area in the middle of a sarcomere. Because the protein in the middle of a sarcomere is the thick filament. So if we were looking at this <coughs> under a microscope and really with an electron microscope, you would be able to see a pattern of a, a light pattern, dark pattern, light pattern, dark pattern that runs down the length of the sarcomeric unit. I'm sorry, of the myofibril because of the sarcomeric unit. So this area that is a little bit lighter is called the I band. The I band is defined as the area of the sarcomere where you only have thin filament and it's just around the Z disc. Now that's in a relaxed muscle. I'm a, you'll see what I, why I have to keep saying that in a minute. So in a relaxed muscle, the muscle, the, the protein is only thin, the thin filaments don't absorb enough light. So a lot more light comes through this area. So it looks lighter under the microscope because there's less protein. It's not as, as thin. So this is a, a light band called the I band. But then the very middle of a sarcomeric unit where the entire myosin thick filament is housed. Obviously it's thicker than the thin filament. It's going to absorb more light, so it's going to look darker. This is called the dark band. So we have a light band, which is the I band, and we have a dark band, which is called the A band. Mm -hmm. The A band is made up of the entire length of the thick filament. So we, we have a regular repeating unit then. Look at this picture. We have a light band and a dark band, a light band and a dark band light, dark, light, dark, regular repeating light and dark pattern down the length of a myofibril. And this is exactly what gives the striated appearance 
in skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue. The arrangements of the thick and thin filaments into sarcomeric units. So the light band where we have thin filament is called the I band. The dark band where we have the thick filament is called the A band. However, look at the pic, a little easier to see the rest of it at this picture at the bottom. So the I band would be from the, this edge of the thick filament this way. So where we only have the thin filament is the I band. However, notice that even in a relaxed muscle, the thin filament partially overlaps the thick filament, right? Now, obviously the thick filament's thicker than the thin filament, so it's always gonna be darker, correct? Yes. However, the little bit of outskirt, the ends, if you will, of the thick filament, where we have a slight overlapping of thick and thin filament, just this little bitty area of the A band is going to look a little bit darker than the very middle of the A band. Because in the very middle of the A band, you don't have that overlapping. Now it, it still is dark, but you only have thick filament. You don't have double filament. You don't have thin and thick. So the outskirts, the edges, if you will, of the A band always look a little bit darker than the very middle of the A band. So the very middle of an A band in a relaxed muscle has a name. H zone. The H zone, very good. The H zone is the area of the A band where you only have thick filament. That's how we define the H zone in a relaxed muscle. So we have the I band. Mm -hmm. We have the A band. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the A band, you have the H, H zone. Mm -hmm. In the very middle of the H zone, you have the M line. M line. Now, these are the parts you have to be able to identify. And if you know it in words, you can, okay, the, the I band is where I only see thin filament. Here's the thin filament. That's the I band. The A band is the entire length of the thick filament. That's the A band. The very middle of the A band is the H zone. And the very middle of the H zone is the M line. Is the M line. Boom. I love it when a plan comes together. Now, we have to be able to identify some of those, you know, these zones and the I bands and, and the A bands and all that. Probably, I don't know if they're going to have a picture on the test or if it's, it's going to be off the model. But after I'm done with this PowerPoint, before we leave for the day, I'm going to pull that model up so we can identify it. All right, so that's a sarcomere. Now I, I left in here, this was really is really for lecture where it has the description, but I wanted to leave it in here so you guys can review it anyway. I'm not gonna ask you the definitions. Well, I might, like on the physiology test, I might say, okay, the Z disc is where uh, the, the thin filament is, is anchored or the Z disc is the edge of the sarcomere, something like that, right? The A band is a thick filament. The I band is where we have thin filament. The H zone is the middle of the A band. And the M line is the middle of the H zone. That's pretty much what you need to know, right? Mm -hmm. So you can come back and review the video with that. The only other reason why I left this table in here from our lecture book is that it's the only picture I could really find very quickly that actually showed a sarcomeric unit from an electron micrograph. So this is greatly enlarged. It's a lot bigger and magna more magnified than any light microscope that you ever use. So this is actually called a transmission electron micrograph. It's a little different than the scanning one, but nonetheless, it comes from an electron microscope. So look at what we're looking at here. We are looking right here at a Z, even if this was not labeled, you would be able to determine the parts of this sarcomere. Because in a, at least in a relaxed muscle, it's very identifiable. The, the area around a, because look, there's a line here, 
There's a line here. There's a line. So how do you know which one is a Z disc, right? That's what I'm trying to get to. Well, I know in a relaxed muscle, which one is a Z disc a little bit easier because just it's on the light. outskirts, it's lighter. Correct. It's lighter around it. So look how light it is around this line. But this line is a little bit light, but not as light as that one or as light as this one. So you would even guess as to say, okay, this is a Z disc to a Z disc. That's one sarcomeric unit right there. So this light area here is the I band. From this dark area right here, all the way to the edge of the dark over here is the A band. Mm -hmm. Notice in the very middle though, it's just a little bit lighter in the middle. That's called the H zone. Mm -hmm. It looks like the letter H <laughs> almost. So this is called the H zone. That little bitty line in the middle that's a little bit darker in this slightly mm -hmm. lighter area is the, always the M line. So that's how you identify those parts. So right here, you have thin filament. Right here, you have an overlapping of thick and thin filament. Right here, you only have thick filament. Right here, you have an overlapping of thick and thin filament. But right here, you only have thin filament. So you have thin, thick and thin, thick, thick and thin, and thin. So that's the arrangement. So this is what it looks like in both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, by the way. That's what gives those tissues their striated appearance. Now, these are the important muscle proteins and their category. We can categorize the proteins as either being contractile. So we already talked about the thick and thin filament, myosin and actin, respectively, right? We haven't talked about the regulatory proteins yet, but we're about to. Well, I guess I have to do it off of here. I don't know if I have that picture again. No, I don't have that picture again. All right, so I need to tell you about the regulatory proteins and, and how this is going to work off of this picture. But we have these two regulatory proteins. Now, what I mean to say by that, these are the proteins that exactly control the regulation between contraction and relaxation. Like when the muscle will contract or when it will relax. These are the proteins that control that. They're called troponin and tropomyosin, right? Now, troponin and tropomyosin are found in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. They're not found in smooth muscle. Smooth muscle has its own regulatory proteins, all right, um, which are not listed here. I may tell you about them at the end. And then we have these structural proteins. I already mentioned titan. I mentioned dystrophin right? I briefly mentioned myomecin, but I didn't talk about nebulin and alpha. This should be alpha actin nin, by the way. I misspelled that. This should be an in on the end. Alpha actinin. So when you go to review this, this PowerPoint, this in is going to be missing off of here, by the way, because I'm not going to re-upload it just to put those two letters in there. I just noticed that. But anyway, Titan, nebulin, alpha actinin, myomycin, and dystrophin are all called structural proteins. They don't do anything to bring about contraction. They don't regulate contraction. Their job is to structurally organize, support, and arrange all of the other proteins in a myofibril, right? So if I go back up to here, Nebulin is surrounding these other proteins, organizing them within the sarcomeric unit. They're not, you're not going to identify it. You just have to know nebulin is a supportive protein. It's a structural protein. Titan is, is responsible for organizing and supporting the thick filament in the sarcomere, as you see here in the picture. Myomycin is what organizes and attaches the myosin filament together. Because I don't know, I didn't say it and you, you can see it, but I don't know if you realize it, this myosin molecule is bi-directional. They have some of the head groups on the left, some of the head groups on the right. So what this would be like, and I'll, when I'm in class teaching this, I, I would say something like, if I made two students uh, lie down on the floor and put their feet together, 
one student would have their head at this end, the other student has their head at this end and their feet would be touching in the middle. That's how a myosin filament is arranged. Each one of the myosin molecules forms the entire filament. So the feet of each of the molecules touch each other at the M line. And myomesin basically ties in all of the feet together to make one continuous filament. So it structurally organizes the thick filament in the middle. That's what myomesin is. And myomesin forms that M line. Now, alpha actinin also is not identified on here, but alpha actinin is one of the structural support proteins that anchors this actin, thin actin filament to the Z disc. So that's what is holding, that's one of the proteins holding the thin filament on the Z disc. That's what alpha actinin is. All right, so on the test, you just need to know these classifications of these proteins. And now I'm gonna teach you what these do, the regulatory proteins. Down here, you see the thin filament. The thin filament is called an actin filament. The actin filament is made up of individual circular subunits. So you see these little bitty balls on here mm -hmm. that are bound together and twisted. You see a slight twist in the filament. Each one of those little circular structures is an individual monomer that bonds together to make the filament. And each one of those little circles is called a globular actin or G-actin. Now, when they bond together, that's called polymerization, by the way. They make a polymer, if you remember that term from general biology. Mm -hmm. So when they are polymerized or bound together, the entire actin filament is called F-actin, which stands for filamentous actin. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this so specifically is this. Each one of the little G actins has a little dark dot on it that the artist kind of draws in right there. You see that? Mm -hmm. There's a little darker dot on each one. That little dark dot area is vitally important to our physiology talk. Because each one of these little globular actins has a binding site mm -hmm. for this myosin head group. That little binding site on each one of the globular actins in a relaxed muscle is being blocked by tropomyosin. Mm -hmm. So if the binding site for the myosin head group is being blocked, the myosin head group, which is the molecular motor, can never bind to that spot and thus can never pull on the thin filament. So tropomyosin's job is to cause relaxation, bring about relaxation by blocking the binding sites from myosin. That's tropomyosin's job. So in the picture, you can see tropomyosin is running. It's a very short filament. It only runs the, this length right here. So it runs from there and see how it twists. It goes mm -hmm. with the actin filament. So this would be one, this would be one. It's a very short and it's a repeating unit down the length of the actin filament. So tropomyosin's job is to block these myosin head binding sites when, and basically causes our muscle to stay relaxed. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do in order to contract the muscle in some way is get that tropomyosin filament to move out of the way of those little binding sites. And this is where the little twist of the actin filament comes into play. Remember just now I said these globular actins are bound together and they're twisting in the filament. You can see mm -hmm. how it's a little twisted. That little twist introduces a groove in the, in the actin filament. There's a little groove right there. Now, when we want to get our muscle to contract in some way, 
this tropomyosin filament is physically going to move into this groove and thus expose those myosin head binding sites. The second that those myosin head binding sites are exposed, those myosin head groups automatically reach up, bind to their binding site, and they pull on that thin filament. And here's what it's going to look like. So if I want to get this muscle to contract, ultimately each sarcomeric unit has to contract, which makes the myofibril contract, which makes the muscle cell contract, right? So how do I get the sarcomere to contract? Well, I have to make the tropomyosin move out of the way of these little myosin head binding sites on the actin filament. The second that the tropomyosin moves out of the way, that little head group can reach up, bind to the thin filament, and then pull it towards the M line. Same thing on this side. The tropomyosin physically moves into that little twisted groove, exposing the myosin head binding sites. The myosin head groups reach up, they bind to the thin filament, and they pull on it towards the M line. That is the role of tropomyosin. In a contracting muscle, this tropomyosin is physically moved into that groove, exposing the binding sites for the myosin head groups. In a relaxed muscle, the tropomyosin is moved back into place over the binding sites, thus blocking the myosin head groups from ever binding to it and if the myosin head groups cannot bind to the thin filament, do you think they can ever pull on it? That would be like me asking you to pull on a rope without grabbing the rope. Of course, you can't pull the rope until you grab it. So before the myosin filament molecule can pull on the thin filament, the myosin head group has to grab the rope, so to speak, first. And if the little binding sites are being blocked by tropomyosin, the myosin head groups can never grab the rope and you're not going to contract your muscle. Now, that leads me into this. How do we get tropomyosin to move in the first place when we want to contract our muscle? So it's pretty easy to see, yep, all we have to do is move that tropomyosin. It exposes the head groups, which allows the myosin head to bind to it and pull on it which causes contraction. But how? what causes tropomyosin to move? Well, that brings into play troponin. Troponin is the second regulatory protein, which is demonstrated with these three little blue dots. That's because there's three subunits to it. We're not learning all three subunits. <coughs> Excuse me, but I'll just tell you, the reason why there's three subunits is one of the subunits binds to actin, one of the subunits binds to troponin, and one of the subunits binds to calcium ions. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and cheat and tell you the trigger for muscle contraction, the actual trigger that causes the muscle to contract is calcium. Our muscles cannot contract without calcium. Specifically, when calcium is released from the SR that we're about to learn, it goes to one place and one place only. And hear me good on this one. In order to get our muscle to contract, we have to flood the sarcoplasm with calcium. Where does the calcium come from? It comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when the SR is told to release its calcium into the sarcoplasm, the calcium goes to one place and one place only. It goes to troponin. Calcium binds to troponin. And the second that calcium binds to troponin, 
the calcium troponin complex causes tropomyosin to physically move out of the way of the binding sites, which allows the myosin head group to bind to actin and then pull on it, and we just cause the muscle to contract. That's a large part of our physiology talk, by the way, right there. So how do we get the muscle to contract? Well, we have to flood the sarcoplasm, which is all loaded down with these myofibrils. Calcium has to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That calcium diffuses through the sarcoplasm, goes to one place and one place only, troponin. When calcium binds to troponin, it causes tropomyosin to move out of the way of the myosin head binding sites thereby exposing the binding sites so the myosin head group can bind to actin and pull on it towards the M line and you contract your muscle. That's what the regulatory proteins are doing. Now, before I get into that physiology talk, there's two concepts that we have to learn real quick. They're not too terribly difficult. But we need to learn well, what causes the muscle to contract. I already gave it away anyway. The thick filament pulls on the thin filament. Mm -hmm. Right? That's yes. called the sliding filament theory or the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. So I just left this little text in here so you can read it. But it's pretty, you can even learn it just by looking at this picture. The sliding filament theory or mechanism of muscle contraction states that the basically the filaments never change their length. Long time ago, scientists thought the lengths of the filaments changed. They don't. And the reason why they thought it changed is because when we look at a relaxed muscle relative to a fully contracted muscle, the length of the sarcomeric units are much shorter in a contracted muscle than they are in a relaxed muscle. So in a relaxed muscle, the sarcomeric units, which are demonstrating two of them here, are much longer. Albeit, this is still very microscopic. But in a relaxed muscle, the length is longer than in a fully contracted muscle. So here's what happens. In a contracting muscle, if tropomyosin is forced out of the way of the binding sites, myosin will pull on the actin filaments towards the M line, like I just said. Right? Now that begins to shorten each sarcomeric unit as the actin filaments are being pulled towards their M line. But look what happens. Look what really changes length. The filaments never change length, but the parts of the sarcomere we already identified change the length. So remember the I band? It's where we have thin filament around the Z disc. And we had the, the A band, which is the thick mm -hmm. filament, right? Look what happens to the I band and the H zone as the muscle begins to contract. As, and just re remember the A band on the outskirts, we have a slight overlapping of thick and thin filament. Remember, it's a little darker right there than the middle. Mm -hmm. Well, look what happens when the thick filament starts to pull the thin filament over itself. Basically, the thick filament is pulling the thin filament over itself towards the M line. If you start to pull that thin filament over the thick filament, you're basically going to have a larger distance over the thick filament where you have thick and thin filament, which means the H zone is going to shorten. Because remember, the H zone is the area of the A band where you only have thick filament. Well, if you begin to pull the thin filament over the thick filament sooner or later, you're going to have a complete overlapping of thick and thin filament. Mm -hmm. You have no H zone. For that matter, the I band disappears because look, mm -hmm. look where the Z disc is rearranged in a contracted muscle. The end of the thick filament is all the way to the Z disc. So the I band shortens. So here's the electron micrograph of it. Look how big the I band is here. You have lighter around the Z disc. Look at the H zone. 
So here's a relaxed muscle. Here's a partially contracting muscle or muscle in contraction. Here's a completely contracted muscle. Notice the distance of the I band up here relative to the I band down here. And look where the H zone used to be here. This distance got a little bit shorter here and it's totally gone here because all you're left with right here is the M line right there. So in the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction, the H zone shortens and the I band shortens as the muscle is contracting because the filaments get slid over each other and you have complete overlapping of thick and thin filament. So the H zone is gone and the I band is really gone. I mean, a little bitty portion of it's still there, but you, you, you see what I'm saying. It shortens drastically. Now I want you to just, uh, Understand about the H zone and I band shortening with contraction and how the filaments are sliding past each other. The second thing that we have to talk about, and then we're going to get into our physiology talk to finish up. I hear people coming in and out or leaving, probably tired of me talking. I know you're tired. I'm, all, I'm going to be done in a minute. Um, we have to go over the contraction cycle. And for this, I, I want you to know the basics of each four of these steps right here. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. And it's not too terribly difficult, but in order to get a muscle to contract, you really need two things and two things only. You need calcium and you need ATP, which means you need oxygen as well. I mean, I'm not talking, you need to be able to make the ATP. Now I'm not going over the three mechanisms by which ATP is being made. You covered aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration and probably the creatine phosphagen system in general biology. They're also located in our lecture class or in your lecture class, but I'm not putting that on the test, all right? But everybody remembers aerobic respiration, right? You burn sugar with oxygen, you make ATP, right? So we need ATP and we need calcium. So look at number one. When ATP binds to the myosin head group, the myosin head group is the molecular motor, if you remember, which means it's an enzyme. That myosin head group, a portion of it, has the ability to hydrolyze ATP, basically split the phosphate group off of it. So by splitting that terminal phosphate group off of ATP, you're left with ADP and phosphate. So if you don't remember what this is, this is adenosine triphosphate, has three phosphates on it, if you remember that. And then ADP is adenosine diphosphate. So as soon as ATP, binds to the head group, the head group hydrolyzes it into ADP and P. Now the energy that is released from breaking that terminal phosphate bond, it's called the high energy phosphate bond, that energy is used to, to cock the head group into place, like loading a spring. So the myosin head group hydrolyzes ATP and it becomes energized and ready to do its job. If calcium, which is the purple dot, is present and bound to troponin, tropomyosin will be physically moved into that groove like I mentioned earlier. So when tropomyosin is in that groove, the myosin head binding sites on actin are exposed. Now, as soon as that myosin head group is energized and cocked into place from the use of ATP energy and the myosin head groups are exposed, the myosin head group binds to the actin filament. When the myosin head group binds to the actin filament at the binding sites, it forms what is called a cross bridge. So in step two, we form the cross bridge, which is the binding of the myosin head group with the actin filament. At that time, the phosphate group is going to be released from the myosin head group. And the release of that phosphate group is triggering the release of our spring. Boom. And it pulls on the actin filament, which is called the power stroke. So in step three, we have what's called the power stroke. The power stroke is the physical movement of the actin filament 
basically sliding over the thin filament when the myosin head group pulls on the thin filament. That's called the power stroke. Now, <clears throat> after the power stroke, that adenosine diphosphate molecule will be released from the head group. This has to happen in order for a new ATP to bind to the head group. Now, the binding of this new ATP to that head group is what causes the myosin head group to detach from the actin filament. If ATP is not present, that myosin head group will never let go of that actin filament. And this is exactly why when someone dies, their body gets hard called rigor mortis. Because when the body is dead, it doesn't generate ATP anymore. So all of a sudden, all of the membranes start to, to rupture open, releases all the calcium, and all of the, the, the few ATPs that are in the cell as we die are used to fully contract and pull on the thin filament. And when all of the ATP is gone, there's no more ATP, this myosin molecule is locked into place in a pulled position on the thin filament which means all of the skeletal muscles in the body are contracted. So the body's hard and that's called rigor mortis, all right? Now you're gonna learn a little bit more about that in lecture. I'm not putting rigor mortis on the test, but I always like talking about that. That'll help allow you to remember that we need ATP to rebond to the myosin head group so it can detach and do the process all over again. So as soon as ATP binds, it detaches, it hydrolyzes the ATP into ADP and P, which energizes and cocks it into its pulling position. It then binds to the actin filament if the binding sites are exposed, if calcium is present. It lets go of the phosphate group, and then we have the power stroke. You pull on the thin filament. ADP detaches, allows another ATP to attach, and we start the process all over again. So I want you to know these four steps of the contraction cycle. All right, now, I have a little bit to talk about dealing with the physiology of contraction. And then we're gonna finish up this little PowerPoint. I have a few slides left to cover. And the last thing I wanna do is show you one of the models, and then I'm gonna let you go for today after I field your questions. Uh, so you can use the rest of your, your day to review all of those models to identify the muscles. So the last thing that we have to do for the physiology portion is to really talk about how does the nervous system tell the muscle to contract to begin with? How, in other words, how does, how does the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is represented in this, in this picture right here, to know when it's supposed to release its calcium? Because remember, the second that calcium is released from the SR, it floods the sarcoplasm, goes to one place and one place only, troponin. The second that calcium binds to troponin, tropomyosin is forced out of the way of those binding sites, which allows the myosin head group to bind to actin. And as soon as the, it binds to actin, it pulls on it towards the M line and you get contraction. So what we have to learn is, how does the sarcoplasmic reticulum know when to release calcium to trigger all of these events anyway? Well, here is what happens. Beginning at the end of the story still, in the muscle membrane, the sarcolemma, and diving into each of the T-tubules is an electrical potential, an electrical signal, if you will. Basically, our, our muscle tissue, our muscle cells are electrical in nature. It's called excitability. Basically, your muscle tissue and your nervous tissue has the ability to generate electrical impulses. Electrical impulses are called action potentials. So the action potential that is being generated and then propagated down the length of the sarcolemma, 
is called a muscle action potential. So in some way, we're going to jumpstart a muscle action potential, which is electricity basically in the muscle cell. It's going to move along the length, which is called propagation, of the length of the sarcolemma, and it's going to dive into a T-tubule. When this electrical potential dives into a T-tubule, it causes for the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. These voltage-gated channels cause release channels, calcium release channels, on the SR to open. So this electrical potential that dives into the T-tubule causes these calcium channels on the SR to open. These channels on the SR are called calcium release channels. These calcium release channels only open when an electrical potential dives into the T-tubule, which causes for a voltage-gated calcium channel to open. When these voltage-gated calcium channels open, causes these calcium release channels to open. I think someone needs to be muted. Yes, can whoever has their mic open, can we mute for, unless it's, you have a question? Thank you. All right, thank you for that. All right, so when the action potential dives into the T-tubule, it causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open. And voltage-gated just means that a change in electricity opens the gate. That's what voltage-gated channels are. They open in response to electrical changes. So that electrical energy flowing in the T-tubule opens a voltage-gated calcium channel, which triggers for the opening of the calcium release channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium then goes down its gradient from high concentration in the SR out to the sarcoplasm where it's low in concentration. The calcium gets in the, in the sarcoplasm, goes to one place and one place only, troponin. When it binds to troponin, it causes tropomyosin to move out of the way of the binding sites for myosin. The myosin head groups reach up bind to the actin filament and pull on the actin filament and we have contraction. Now I said that part of the story a few times already so hopefully that makes sense. What we have to talk about now is the the junction between the nervous system and the muscle cell itself or in other words the place where your nervous system communicates with the muscle cell which is called the synapse all neurons of the nervous system make contact with their target cells at a junction called a synapse. And the synapse between the nervous system and the muscle cell here has its own special name. It's called the neuromuscular junction. Now, the area where the neuron which is the cell of the nervous system, makes contact with the muscle cell. It does not physically touch the target cell. It leaves a little fluid-filled space between it. I'm going to show you that in the picture in a second. However, the part of the muscle membrane, remember the muscle membrane is called the sarcolemma, right? The part of the sarcolemma that is directly adjacent to the neuron at the neuromuscular junction, that little section of the sarcolemma has a special name itself. The little patch of the sarcolemma that is directly adjacent to the neuron at the neuromuscular junction is called the motor end plate. Now, I want you to read through this text I have in here, but I'm going to teach everything from this picture. The picture is worth, in this case, a million words. Everybody's heard a picture's worth a thousand words, right? Well, we can learn everything we need to know about 
the communication between the nervous system and the muscle cell off of this picture. I don't think it's too terribly difficult. I think it's fairly simple. But what I think students have trouble with, again, is keeping all of the names straight. All right. So we have a stepwise fashion of communication between the nervous system and the muscle in order to achieve all of these events that we just talked about, getting calcium to be released and everything. So how do we do that? What jump starts this action potential in the muscle membrane anyway is what we're about to learn. Because thus far, all I said, an action potential in the sarcolemma dives in a T-tubule, opens a voltage-gated calcium channel, which opens the calcium release channel on the SR, calcium floods the sarcoplasm, goes to one place and one place only, which is troponin, which causes tropomyosin to move, exposing the binding sites for myosin and myosin will bind to the binding sites and pull on actin. That's all I said so far. But what we have to figure out, what generates this electrical potential in the sarcolemma? And here's how it works. All of your skeletal muscle cells have an attachment of a neuron, which is a cell from the nervous system. The cells in the nervous system called neurons that carry electrical impulses towards its target are called motor neurons. All neurons carrying electrical potentials away from your brain and spinal cord out to the perimeter of your body to a target are always called a motor neuron. The type of motor neuron that innervates skeletal muscle tissue are referred to as somatic motor neurons. Now we're gonna learn this name for that part of the nervous system on the next test. This is a portion of what we call the peripheral nervous system. But this is what we call a motor neuron. The very end or down the length of a motor neuron is a little filament called the axon. At the very, which the axon is like the little wires in the body, just like you have wires in your house. You flip a switch and electricity goes through the wire. The analogy of the wire would be the axon. At the very end of an axon, you have little bitty terminals where the axon is terminating is called an axon terminal. So these little bitty terminations where the axon is terminating is called an axon terminal. Look at the very end of an axon terminal. It's larger in volume. Little, it's bulbulous. Looks like a little, little bulb right there. See how it gets a little bit bigger? Even in this bigger picture over here. You have the axon terminal, which is a, a slightly thinner filament. And then at the very end, it gets big. The, the end of an axon terminal where it bulbs out like that is called the synaptic end bulb. Now, the reason why this name is important is because inside the synaptic end bulb are these tiny little membrane bound vesicles right here, which I'm going to show you from the enlarged picture down here. These little bitty vesicles inside the synaptic end bulb contain little bitty chemical signal medi mediators that signal its targets. And the chemical signals that neurons from the nervous system release onto their targets are generically called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters. So these little vesicles are called synaptic vesicles. They contain a neurotransmitter. You're learning your first one today, unless you already covered it in your lecture. So the first neurotransmitter that we're learning is called acetylcholine, ACH. Acetylcholine has to be released from these synaptic vesicles and, and diffuse through a fluid-filled cleft. Remember I said the neuron does not physically touch the cell? So the membrane of the neuron does not physically touch the membrane, the sarcolemma of the muscle cell. But rather, this whole area is called a synapse. 
where a neuron is communicating with a target is called a synapse. This one is called the neuromuscular junction. So in the middle of the synapse is a fluid filled cleft called the synaptic cleft. It's filled with extracellular fluid, water. So these acetylcholine neurotransmitters have to be released from the synaptic vesicles into this cleft. So we need to figure out what causes these neurotransmitters, which are always excitatory on our skeletal muscle. Acetylcholine is what's going to start to trigger the events in order to bring about muscle contraction. Acetylcholine is excitatory on skeletal muscle. But if acetylcholine is released by a neuron on your heart, it's inhibitory. We're going to learn that a little bit more later. But neurotransmitters can either be excitatory or inhibitory on their target. In this case, acetylcholine is always 100% of the time excitatory on skeletal muscle. That means when this neuron releases acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft and it binds to its receptor in some way, it's gonna trigger and bring about muscle contraction. It's going to excite the cell. So let's see how we get acetylcholine released. Here's how it works. The neurons in the nervous system generate electrical impulses. I'm sure you know that already. Our brain and spinal cord and all the neurons that make up these nervous tissues in our body, in the central nervous system, and in this case, the peripheral nervous system, those neurons generate electrical impulses called action potentials. The action potential, when it's generated, will propagate down the length of an axon until it reaches an axon terminal, and that action potential re goes down the axon terminal and reaches the synaptic end bulb. When the action potential reaches the synaptic end bulb, it causes voltage-gated calcium channels in the membrane of the synaptic end bulb to open. The action potential opens voltage-gated calcium channels in the synaptic end bulb, which causes extracellular calcium out here to flow into the synaptic end bulb. The influx of this calcium into the synaptic end bulb is what causes, directly causes, the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the membrane of the synaptic end bulb. When those synaptic vesicles fuse with the membrane of the synaptic end bulb, it opens the synaptic vesicle up and releases the acetylcholine to the synaptic cleft. All of that is a fancy way of saying exocytosis. And everybody remembers that name from general biology, right? This is nothing more than exocytosis. So the influx of calcium through the voltage-gated calcium channels in the synaptic end bulb causes for the exocytosis of acetylcholine into the cleft. Now, acetylcholine diffuses to the sarcolemma at the neuromuscular junction, and this area of the sarcolemma has its special name. The only place on the entire muscle cell, the sarcolemma, the only place on the sarcolemma of the entire muscle cell where we have acetylcholine receptors is the motor end plate. This is the only place where acetylcholine receptors are located. It's called the motor end plate. You don't have receptors over here. You don't have receptors over here. You only have receptors at that little patch of the sarcolemma that is directly adjacent to the synaptic end bulb at the neuromuscular junction. So that little area of the sarcolemma is called the motor end plate. Now, this receptor for acetylcholine is a ligand-gated sodium channel. I'll say it again. 
the acetylcholine receptor, which are these little green channels, is called a ligand gated, or a newer name called chemically gated, ligand, chem, ligand gated and chemically gated mean the same thing. As soon as acetylcholine binds to its receptor, which is this sodium channel, the sodium channel opens, sodium rushes from the extracellular fluid to the inside of the sarcoplasm across the membrane. And it is the movement of positively charged sodium ions across the membrane that generates the action potential in both neurons and in the muscle membrane, the sarcolemma. So acetylcholine has to jumpstart the action potential in the motor end plate by opening these ligand gated sodium channels. So it's the influx of this sodium, which is generating this electrical potential in the motor end plate. When the electrical potential reaches the edges of the motor end plate, you have fully generated an action potential in the muscle membrane, the sarcolemma. So this is a summary chart of everything that I just said. The nerve impulse or the action potential in the axon terminal comes down. The only thing it doesn't show here is the voltage gated calcium channels, but the voltage gated calcium channels will open. Calcium will flood the synaptic end bulb, cause acetylcholine to be exocytosed into the synaptic cleft, which binds to its receptor which is a ligand gated sodium channel. When acetylcholine is bound to the channel, the channel opens, sodium rushes across the, the sarcolemma, which generates the muscle action potential. That action potential dives into a T-tubule, which activates a voltage gated calcium channel. The activation of this voltage gated calcium channel is what opens the calcium release channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum inside the muscle cell. When the calcium release channels are open, calcium floods the sarcoplasm, goes to one place and one place only, troponin. It binds to troponin. Calcium binds to troponin, causes tropomyosin to move, exposing the myosin head binding sites. The myosin molecules will then reach up, bind to the actin filament, and pull on it and you have muscle contraction. Whew. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that's a good bit of information right there, right? So you need to organize your time wisely so you can go and review this material. I want you to know these steps. Now, let me see if I took it out of here. I think I did just to help you out with lecture. And it might be as well, it is right here. How do we get the muscle to relax? We don't want the muscle contracted constantly, right? Well, what jump started all of that signal process to begin with? Well, let's see. What jump started the sig all of that signaling process to begin with to get the muscle to contract was the neuron firing. Basically, you're thinking about contracting a muscle. Now we want to relax the muscle. So you know what we do? We stop having our neuron fire to the muscle. And then these events occur. When the neuron stops firing to the muscle, you stop releasing calcium into the synaptic cleft. Now that alone will not cause the muscle to relax because look what we have. Yeah, we're not releasing any more acetylcholine, but there's still acetylcholine in the cleft. That acetylcholine is bound to their receptors, the ligand gated sodium channels. So what we really have to do <clears throat> is we have to close these sodium channels, which would stop the action potential in the muscle membrane. So how do we close the channel? We have to get rid of acetylcholine. So how do we get rid of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft? Hmm. Well, we have to break it down with an enzyme. 
The enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine is called acetylcholinesterase. And you know this is an enzyme because it ends in ASE. Acetylcholinesterase is the enzyme that renders acetylcholine non-functional. Like a little pair of molecular scissors, it cuts acetylcholine in, into two pieces. It breaks it down, so it causes it's it's released from its receptor. So then that channel closes. If you close the channel, you then stop the action potential in a muscle membrane, the sarcolemma. With no action potential in the sarcolemma, you don't have a, a action potential in the T tubule. When the action potential is not in a T tubule, these channels close and we stop releasing calcium to the sarcoplasm. Now, once we stop releasing calcium to sarcoplasm, that necessarily does not stop contraction on its own either because we still have calcium bound to troponin. So we have to take the calcium off of troponin. Yeah, we need to stop releasing calcium. We do that by stopping the action potential. But we have to remove the calcium that was previously released. So how do we do that? Well, we do that with calcium pumps. Calcium pumps are active transporters that use ATP in order to pump calcium up its concentration gradient back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now there's a protein on the inside of the SR that stores the calcium for us in here. That name might be in here. I didn't read through all these words yet, but I know it's in your lab manual. It's called calsequestrin. So calsequestrin is a protein that stores calcium on the inside of the SR for us. So I'm just telling you that in case you encounter a question on the test. So that protein on, on the inside of the SR is called calsequestrin. All right, so we just relaxed the, relaxed the muscle on that point. Now, we only have a couple of things left. <clears throat> so if, if you go home and study that physiology we just went through and you have questions, you know, just, you know, email me or ask me. We're almost done. I only have a couple of slides left to cover. And one of them just deals with the actual stages of contraction. So if we hook the muscle up to a machine and measured the force of contraction as the muscle contracted, we would get a tracing like this. This is what we call a muscle twitch, a complete contraction. A muscle twitch involves three basic phases. Something called a latent period where we don't, where the, the muscle is stimulated to contract, but we don't see any force yet. And then once we start to see the force, we call that the contraction phase. And then once the force starts to be alleviated, we call that relaxation, pretty simple. So those two phases are pretty simple. You generate force during contraction, you alleviate force when you relax. The latent period is a short amount of time during which we have stimulated the muscle to contract, but it didn't do anything yet that we can notice. It's doing something, but it's not generating force. And this amount of time is very, very, very small. Notice the timeline down here is in milliseconds. There's a thousand milliseconds in one second. So this muscle twitch and skeletal muscle is on the order of only 50 milliseconds or so. That's faster than you can ever try to snap your fingers, by the way. Very, very, very quick muscle twitch. Now, the latent period is the time it takes for all of this signaling to occur. From the time acetylcholine is released to bind to its receptor, for sodium to go across the sarcolemma to generate the action potential to go to the T-tubule, to open the voltage-gated calcium channels, to release calcium out of the SR, to go to troponin to make tropomyosin move, for the myosin head groups to pull on actin. All of that signaling takes two to five milliseconds. Very, very quick, but it is still a little bit of the time period there. Now, after a muscle contracts, there is something called the refractory period. I'm just going to tell you what it is. We're not going into all the different types right now, but the refractory period is, a, is the amount of time <clears throat> 
it takes before a muscle can contract again after a previous contraction. Now for skeletal muscle, refractory periods are very, very, very short, which is the exact reason why you can have a Charlie horse. Everybody knows what that is. Your muscle contracts and it locks up and it doesn't feel like it's relaxing, right? That means that your muscle is contracting over and over and over and over again without relaxing. So uh, your heart luckily has a very long refractory period. So our heart does not go into a Charlie horse. That would be bad. You would die. Basically, your heart would contract and not relax and you're having a massive, you know, heart attack that way. So anyway, some muscle tissues have very long refractory periods. Some have short muscle. Skeletal muscle has a very short refractory period. Now, here's a picture of cardiac muscle. I'm just showing this picture. The physiology is somewhat the same on the inside of the cell. However, you could sever every single nerve that goes to your heart and your heart is still going to contract on its own because your heart has its own electrical conduction system. And everybody knows at least one part of it, the pacemaker. So the main difference is how the electrical potentials are being generated and not necessarily what is going on on the inside of the cell. Because cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle both have actin and myosin. They both have troponin and tropomyosin. And all three muscle types require calcium to trigger the contraction. But how the electrical potentials get started is what's different. Not every single cardiac muscle cell in your heart has a nervous system attachment to it. But every single skeletal muscle fiber in a muscle organ has an axon terminal going to it. Every single muscle cell in a muscle organ has one of these attachments. That's different for your heart. So we're gonna learn all about that in AMP2. The main reason I'm showing you this picture is in case they, they want you to identify cardiac muscle tissue. Notice in this picture, you can see some striation, these lines in here a little bit. They're very faint, but you can see little bitty lines in there. That's the striations. Now, how are you gonna tell the difference between this and skeletal muscle, which I don't have a picture of, are these thicker lines you see here. Skeletal muscle does not, they'll have these little striations, but they won't have these thick lines. These thick lines in cardiac muscle are called intercalated discs. Skeletal muscle tissue does not have that. Now, here's smooth muscle. The main reason why I put this, you probably won't be identifying all of this, um, is just to show you the main differences with these regulatory proteins. The contractile proteins are all the same. We still have actin and myosin. However, we don't have regular repeating sarcomeric units. And that's why smooth muscle is not striated. All of the actin and myosin are not arranged into these nice, neat little myofibrils everywhere as they are in cardiac and skeletal muscle. So actin and myosin is the same, but the regulatory proteins are different. The regulatory proteins in, in smooth muscle is an enzyme called calmodulin and a protein, I'm sorry, a protein called calmodulin and an enzyme called myosin light chain kinase or MLCK, myosin light chain kinase. You're going to learn what these two things are doing in lecture. For now, I just want you to know their names. Calmodulin takes the place of troponin. Remember, troponin binds calcium. Calmodulin and smooth muscle binds calcium. Myosin light chain kinase is an enzyme that actually turns on the myosin molecule. All right. So in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, the myosin molecule is always on. It would be like you leaving your engine running all the time. In smooth muscle, the engine, the myosin molecule is not on all the time. We actually have to put a key in, the mo in, the in, in, in there and turn it to turn the engine on. The key to turn the engine on is this enzyme, myosin light chain kinase. 
So when calcium is bound to calmodulin, it turns on myosin light chain kinase. Myosin light chain kinase turns on myosin, which then brings about contraction. Because there's no tropomyosin, the myosin head binding sites are never blocked in smooth muscle. But they don't have to be blocked because the myosin motor is not always on. So that's the main difference. We have to turn myosin on in smooth muscle, but in cardiac and, and skeletal muscle, the myosin molecule is always on. It's the binding sites that are blocked. That's the main difference. Now, the last thing in your uh, packet that I want you to know the definitions for are the types of mu skeletal muscle contraction. So we have a contraction state of muscle tissue that's called isotonic or isometric. Isometric contraction is where a skeletal muscle will contract, but the muscle does not bring about movement. It's called isometric contraction. So I'm starting with that one because we just have one type. So that's like the, the muscles in your neck and your back. You can walk around all day and your back stays erect, your head stays erect, postural muscles, even your core muscles. So if you just stand straight up, but you don't bend over or anything, you're still being supported by muscle contraction, but you're not moving. That would be called isometric contraction. Or like this picture, the student is holding their arm, holding something, but they're not going up or down with it. So the muscles have to be contracting because he's holding the book, but no muscle, no movement is occurring. So when we do have movement, that's called isotonic. There's two types of isotonic contractions. And again, isotonic contractions is when your muscles are contracting, but allowing movement. So we can have what is called an isotonic concentric contraction. And in an isotonic concentric contraction, you actually shorten your muscle as it contracts. So in this case, it's flexing at the elbow. You are shortening your bicep muscle. Your, your bicep is contracting so you can flex. Like if you're in a gym working out and you, you pull a dumbbell up like this, your bicep muscle shortens in order to pull your antibrachium in an upward direction. However, you know you can put, in this case, the book down or put your weight down without just automatically dropping it. That means your muscle has to stay contracted but and allow movement at the same time in the opposite direction, which means your muscle is contracting while it's increasing its length. And that's the difference between concentric and eccentric. Concentric contraction is where a muscle is generating force and shortening at the same time. Eccentric contraction is where a muscle is generating force but increasing its length at the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. So does everybody see that? Yes. All right, very good. So just know the definitions. They are at the very back of your engage chapter. Um, if you want to see their definitions or you could just, all you really have to know is concentric is when the muscle contract generates force and basically shortens. Eccentric is when the muscle generates force and lengthens to bring about that movement. So that's why they show your arm coming up, you're shortening, generating force to pull the book up or your, your, gradually letting it down, which means you have to control the, how much force you're relaxing by, which is still a contraction, right? You're still partially contracted, but you're trying to relax enough to drop the book in the other direction. That's called eccentric. All right, so that's it for this packet. 